Amen. What a beautiful choice of him before we walk through the scriptures tonight. Thank you, Harold, and thank you, Janice. Well, tonight we want to press on in our walk together through 1 Timothy, the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to his mentee, Timothy, near the end of the Apostle Paul's ministry. Last week we left off at chapter 1, verse 11, so tonight we will pick up with verse 12. And if you are using the Pew Bible, that's on page 991. I'm going to read for us verses 12 to 17. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to tell you about an experience I had about a month ago. I was uh, invited to the, a lunch at the home uh, of some friends of mine, some wonderful Christian friends. And we were gathered together, and it was a gathering of, of ministers and mostly non-ordained folk. Um, and we were gathered together because we had a common interest in the Bible um, and matters related to the Bible and the church. And so my friends organized a, a lunch. And um, after lunch, the lunch actually ended up going like four hours. Now that's a lunch right there. Um, so we ate lunch. That didn't take four hours. We, lunch took about, oh, 45 minutes. But then for the rest of the three hours and 15 minutes, um, we began to discuss a very important subject, and I, and I hope it's important to you. We began to discuss the state of the church in our land. Most of these Christians had lived in a time when the church of Jesus Christ had far, far more influence on everyday life, on education, on politics, on all the sectors of society than it does now. And they were reflecting on what they are seeing. And they did this for three hours and 15 minutes, and I just listened. And as you probably can imagine, the report card for the church in the U.S. was, was not good. Um, I don't know if we'd say F, but we certainly weren't passing. So I guess that's an F. So. <laughs> but I, I started to hear things like, we've lost our vision. We have forgotten why we exist. Um, the nation... The U.S. is morally decaying, and the church is just kind of slowly and slowly becoming irrelevant. I mean, it's like the rest of the nation is having a party on the dock, and they've untied the church, and we're just floating away. And we're over there yelling and screaming to do different, but our voice is just getting fainter and fainter because we're just drifting away. That's what they saw. And so, obviously, when you start talking about that, they started comparing the church here in the U.S. to the church in the third world. A lot of them had taken much, many more trips overseas than I had, and they started to comment on all the differences they see between Christians here and Christians in, in the third world. And after about two hours and 45 minutes of that, the sum of what they said was, well, if we would just be like them, all our problems would get better. You know, if, if we would just simplify our lifestyle. They, they, you know, they don't have much. All they've got is their faith. And, and that's, why, uh, that's why the gospel has so much impact in places like Africa and India and Central America. If we would just simplify our lifestyle. Or if we would just appreciate what we have. I mean, we have more resources in the U.S. than any other church in the history of the world. If we would just appreciate what we have, then maybe we could get back on track. You know, if we would just hunger for the truth, if we would just hunger for solid biblical preaching and teaching the way they did, all this would get better. And you know, it's been about a month since that conversation. And I look back and I say, well, maybe. Maybe. Maybe that, maybe that will, maybe that's the solution. But then I consider what I'm about to read to you. And I see that God has a better way. God has a more powerful way to deal with that problem. God has a way of retying our voice back to the dock of our nation than just mimicking the habits 
of brothers and sisters in other countries. Now that may be helpful, but God has something more powerful here in 1 Timothy 1, verses 12 to 17. So let me read that for us, and then we'll talk about it. I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and de deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, just the reading of these words lands on us with a holy power and authority. We can feel something majestic in what we've just read. And Father, I pray that you would send forth your Spirit to help me disclose and uncover that power and that authority. That these words might make a deep and lasting impression upon us tonight. That we might indeed leave the sanctuary different than when we came in. Father, these are beautiful, wonderful, majestic words, and I pray for your beautiful, wonderful, majestic spirit to help me open them. And I'm asking all this for the sake of your name, for the sake of your kingdom, and for the sake of your will. So make the words of my mouth, I pray, in the meditations of all our hearts tonight, a pleasing and loving, loving offering to you, O Lord Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Through you we pray. Amen. All right, now, before I go any further, I, I have to ask, all right, is anyone's heart not aching yet based off what we talked about before I read the scripture? Right, is anyone indifferent now, don't raise your hand, but is anyone indifferent or apathetic to what my friends and I were talking about in the dining room? I mean, is anyone disinterested in the state of the church in our land? Now, I ask because you very well might be. And, and I'm not going to criticize you. There's nothing wrong. You know, sometimes we just live so day to day, you know, <laughs> we, some of us don't have four hours to go to lunch and talk about these sorts of things. So, if that's where you are, and that's okay, what I want to do for just a minute is try to stir your heart up so that you can feel about these things, I think, the way that God would want you to feel about these things. All right? So, I want you to picture with me for a minute what it would be like. What would it be like if your whole family were to come to worship every Lord's Day here at Third Presbyterian, Sunday school, morning worship, evening worship, your whole family. Kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews. What would that be like? What would it be like if we had to go to two services in the morning? What would it be like if my job at 1030 was to go get a cold towel, tap Richard's head, get him a Coke Zero, a little massage on the back, pat him on the butt, here we go again. What would that be like? What kind of excitement would we have? What would it be like if 
you take that salt class downstairs and some of those young families that are getting together, what would it be like if one of them stood right there and Richard and I prayed over them as we sent them to a foreign country and they've dedicated the rest of their life to reaching people who've never heard the gospel. What would that be like? What would it be like to see a real revival? I mean, not just here in our, in our little world of Third Presbyterian, but what would it be like to see a real revival where we were retethered back to the, the dock of public life in this nation and, we, and people started to listen to the church again about what we had to say about anything? What would that be like for that to sweep across the country and, and, and be a part of that? What would it be like to be a part of the Third Great Awakening? Now, if that's starting to stir you a little bit, you understand why, why it's important to think about these things. Alright, and what I want to ask you is, do you know where all that begins? Those are realistic prayers and hopes, by the way. I don't think that those are unrealistic. But what it means is we're going to have to start by realizing where all of that kind of revival begins. And it begins by realizing... And this is the most important point tonight, that you already have the power for that to happen. You already have what you need to see everything I just described happen. You already do. So you don't, you don't have to necessarily tailor your lifestyle to someone who lives in a country very different than ours. You just have to prefer the power that God has already given you and, and choose that power and not any other. Right now, you all, if I could convince you of this, God would have done something amazing. Right now, you already have the power to see the change that you long for. You already have it. Because you, like Paul, and Timothy have been entrusted with the euangelion, the gospel. And according to the Bible, the gospel is the power of salvation. The message of the Bible is what we need to see our nation in our lives, in our church, and anything else we want to see change, the gospel is the power to change that. All for the good. Now the question is, do you trust me? <laughs> do you trust what I just said? Probably somewhat, but, but we're not quite where Paul is. We're not quite where Paul wants Timothy to be. So what I'm hoping to do for the next few minutes is, is if I explain to you from verses 12 to 17 what it means that God has entrusted to you and to me and to Third Presbyterian His gospel. If I explain to you what that means, would that help you trust the Bible and its message alone to see these things change. You won't go to any other alternative source of power. You won't go to anything else that you could lean on to help these things change. You will, you will turn only to the message of the Bible. Now if I explain that, will that help you trust it? I hope so. Because that's why God has given us verses 12 to 17. So, so what I want to help you do is understand what it means that verse 11, if you look at the end of verse 11 in 1 Timothy 1, that's just as true of you as it is of Paul. Paul, Paul and I'll come back to this in just a second, but Paul there says, describing the gospel, that I have been entrusted with it. That's just as true of you and me and third as it is of Paul. Now what I want to do is explain what that means. That means, number one, that you and I have been appointed to service. And we have been chosen by God to serve in His mission and in His kingdom. That's what it means to be entrusted with the gospel. You've been appointed to service. Number two, and this is the, probably the most glorious and beautiful part, you have tasted grace. 
If you've been entrusted with the gospel, you've been appointed to service, you have tasted, personally experienced divine saving grace. Which means that there's a new way to live. There is a new paradigm, there's a new stencil, there's a new way that God is calling us to live in verse 17. And we're going to call that way of life praise. Praise. Okay? So that's what it means to be entrusted with the gospel. We've been appointed to service, we have tasted grace, and so it's now time to praise God. Okay? Now let's walk through those bit by bit and take them as they come to us in verses 12 to 17. Now when you hear verse 12 and you read that, now is not everything that Paul says there about himself also true of you? Okay, now let's take a look at verse 12 and I'm just going to back up just a little bit to make sure we see how verse 12 fits. Remember we discussed this last week. Um, essentially what's going on at the church where Timothy is pastoring is there are some teachers using the Old Testament, abusing the Old Testament and parts of it in order to teach things that Paul never taught and the result is people are behaving in a very bizarre way in a very destructive, immoral way. And so Paul is showing Timothy, teaching Timothy with this letter how to deal with that. So verses 8 to 10, he's explaining how we are to use the Old Testament. It said the law is good if someone uses it the right way, if someone uses it lawfully. And then he explains who the Old Testament law is laid down for. It's not laid down for righteous people. It's not laid down for people who have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. It's laid down for people who have not been justified. It's laid down for people who behave in all the ways he describes in verses 9 and 10. And then he says, he says that the law is given to correct all that behavior and whatever else contradicts healthy teaching which accords with the gospel the message of Christianity. And then he says, I've been entrusted with that. And that leads him to talk about his own personal experience of the gospel as a way of helping Timothy. All right, now I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. So he says, I give thanks to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the one who has strengthened me or empowered me and the reason he strengthened or empowered me is that he freely chose to call me and make me faithful, make me reliable, make me into somebody whom he could entrust with this message and so he set me aside to service. Okay, So what Paul is doing is making an argument. As I said just a minute ago, he's giving Timothy what he needs to answer these troublemakers in the Ephesian churches. He says, Timothy, we don't impose extra commands onto Christian believers even if they come from Old Testament proof texts. Just because the Bible's present doesn't mean we pay attention to the teaching. Okay? And he says, the reason why, Timothy, we don't do that is that it contradicts the apostles' teaching. And why does it contradict the Apostles' teaching? Why does it contradict the Gospel? Well, because, Timothy, the Gospel is about what God has done and not what we are doing. Alright? The reason why the Gospel is the power of salvation is because it emphasizes entirely what God has done and not what man is doing or should do or must do. Alright? Now, what he does with verse 12 is he says, in order to show you what the gospel's really like, what it really conveys, namely what God has done for man in Jesus Christ, all right, in order to show you that, take me, Timothy, for an example. Take my own life. All right, Jesus Christ appointed me to his service. I am an apostle, which means I am a foundational teacher. I'm not just a teacher like I'm a teacher, okay? I don't have the authority that Paul had. Paul had foundational authority. 
In other words, he had the Spirit of God manifested in him in a particular way. All right, so things that came from his mouth were new and additional for the church, but they were inspired. My words are not. My words are just supposed to open up his words. Okay? Now, why, Timothy, did Jesus do that? Well, he did that because he freely chose to. He freely chose to, chose me to make, he freely chose to make me a reliable steward of his message, and that's why I thank him. So what he's trying to do is say, Timothy, look at my own life. Look at the way God has treated me. Look at how he appointed me to service. Now that's an example of why you must correct this false teaching. Now friends, isn't that just as true of you as it was of Paul? I mean, it is. It is. Now, to help you feel that, uh, let me try to do for you, for just a moment, what Paul did for Timothy. Let me try to take my own life to help you understand that God has appointed you to serve His kingdom because He's freely chosen to and because He's been gracious to you, not because you've proved yourself to be reliable and worthy and attractive. All right, let me try to use my own life. All right, from time to time, um, I bump into people as I'm doing my Christian ministry, maybe teaching, uh, maybe leading a worship service, whatever. But from time to time, as I'm doing ministry, I bump into people that I knew before I was a Christian. Now, when, I, when that happens to me, it's like the check engine light goes on in my car. It's like, okay, pause, caution. And I often let myself think this. I often let myself think, well, I'm a bad witness just by being here. I mean, just by standing up and speaking in the name of Jesus and calling people to be holy and I'm talking to people who know that I haven't been holy, I let myself think, well, um, I'm really not a very good witness and so I'm going to resist ministering to them and I'll just have a very, you know, informal conversation that I won't let drift into spiritual things, okay? That's the exact opposite of how Paul wants you to think. All right? That's the exact opposite. He wants you to realize that you have been, when, to be entrusted with the gospel is, is to be on the other end of grace. To be on the other end, the receiving end of God's divine grace. And a part of that grace is setting you aside to do something specific with your life in order to mediate and minister and share this message. And that is not because you keep a standard. You keep a standard because you love God. You don't keep a standard. You don't keep a standard in order to be accepted and then appointed to service. All right, you've got to get the order right. You've been entrusted with God's grace, and therefore, He has set you aside to service. Okay? And He will do for you as He did for Paul. He will empower you. He will make you fit to stand up and say and do and lead however He needs you to. All right? that, that's what it means to be entrusted with the gospel. Now... I've hinted at it, but you see what's under all, what, what you, you see what's underneath all this, don't you? What's underneath this sermon of being entrusted with the gospel, being entrusted with the power to see the world around us change, is the fact that every single true Christian has tasted the grace of God. All right. Side point, that's what Holy Communion is about. Reminding you that you have personally experienced the saving grace of God. That's what's underneath all this. Now, how does that happen? How does that happen? Well, let's look together at the heart of the passage in verses 13 to 16. Paul says, well, here's how it happened in my life. Here's what it means to taste God's grace. Formerly, I was a blasphemer. That means I publicly lied about 
God. I said that the Son of God was not the Son of God. And the way I carried out that was I chased, I persecuted, I allowed Christians to be killed. And more than that, I was a completely insolent, arrogant, corrupted person. But, there is one of those holy, divine buts in the New Testament. But, I was shown mercy, though I was acting in ignorance and in unbelief. Now listen to the way Paul describes what happened to him. Essentially what he says is it's as though I was taken by the Spirit of God and put under a waterfall. And what came down on me was grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And saying that and looking at verse 14 reminds me of when my grandparents have a beach condo in Perito Key. And their outdoor pool has three waterfalls. And in the summer when it's really, really hot, and you kind of look goofy doing this, but it is, woo, it's worth it. You go under one of those waterfalls and there's just so much weight of water falling on you. It's just like a facial treatment. I mean, it's just falling down on you and you just stand there. And Paul says, that's what it was like. I didn't go into the waterfall. I was going to Damascus. I was knocked off my horse and something hit me. And it was just this flood of divine mercy and forgiveness and pardon and grace. And it was just like I was standing under that waterfall and it just kept pressing and pressing and pressing on me. That's what he's saying in verse 14. Therefore, and, all the, and with that gospel came faith and came love, the kind that you find in Jesus himself. Therefore, Timothy, rest assured that this, what I'm about to say, is trustworthy and deserving and worthy of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, to save people who have blown it, to save people who have blasphemed, who have persecuted, who have murdered, who have broken the law. Among that group of people, I'm the first. And realize this, Timothy, that it's for this reason that I, formerly Saul of Tarsus, was shown mercy, that in me Jesus Christ might show His complete patience as a template or an illustration or a proof of those who are about to believe on Him for life. So that you might know if He forgives someone like Paul, if He pours and floods His grace freely on someone like Paul, He will definitely freely pour His grace on someone like you. Now, friends, every Christian has, can and should find their personal testimony in that personal testimony. Each of us should find ourselves somewhere in verses 13 to 16. I too was shown mercy. I too have been forgiven. I too have been made new. Now, if that's true, all right, and here's the point I want to emphasize for a second. If that's true, if you and I, if our story finds a has a thread that we can stitch to verses 13 to 16 and we can find our life in verses 13 to 16 and we have a similar testimony to Paul, why is it that this grace had so much more impact on Paul than it does on us? Why is that? Why is it that we have experienced the same mercy that Paul did, the same grace, the same gospel, with more resources, more clarity, why does it land on him with so much more depth and power than it does with us? I mean, this man completely changed his life because he experienced the exact same thing that you and I have. And I don't think it's because he had a more dramatic conversion than we do. I think that's what we often say. Oh, well, his, his conversion was so dramatic. He saw the Lord. He was on the Damascus Road. You know, so that's why he was so, that's why he was so radical. I don't think that's true. The difference to me seems to be that this gospel 
this grace had a deeper impact on Paul than it does on us because he was far more confident in the power of the gospel than we are. He is far, far more confident in this gospel to save the worst of sinners and the most decayed of societies than we are. You know how I know that? Because of how little we are depending on the gospel to save sinners and to save the world around us. We are panicking and leaning on everything else except the message. Paul had a confidence that I want us to have. All right, now to help you with that, let me try to illustrate how Paul understood grace. Grace can sometimes be a this very abstract concept that Presbyterians have this little, it's like this, we got this little card in our front pocket and we're the grace people. Like it's our badge, okay? Well, here's, our, here's our grace, okay? But Paul had an understanding of grace that I think was much deeper and more powerful. And let me try to illustrate that for you. Okay, so um, on Sunday, this is kind of easy, I think, to understand. Imagine that you're asleep. <laughs> All right, you're taking a nap on an afternoon like this. Now you're outside, and you're in a beautiful open field, and you're under a giant oak tree. All right, and you're alive, of course, but you're not conscious. Okay? Okay. So the minutes are turning into hours. This sleep feels really good. And then the breeze picks up. And then the, the sun emerges from behind the clouds. And so you start, as you're sleeping, you start to hear the sound of the wind blowing in the leaves of the oak. You start to feel that sun come out from behind that cloud. And now it's shining on your face. And there's a different temperature on this side than on this side. And you start to feel that fresh air blowing over you. And so you wake up. You wake up. You've moved from one state to another. Now while you slept, you had eyes, but you weren't seeing a thing. I mean, you had ears, but you weren't hearing a thing. You were alive, but were you alive? Okay. So what woke you up was the light and the wind, and now you are fully alive. That's how Paul understood grace. It is, it is the light, he said, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And when God opens your eyes, when He lets those scales fall, when you feel the breeze of God's Spirit moving you to wake up and to live differently and to live radically, that is what Paul means by grace. And he was confident that that grace that you find only in Christ Jesus is powerful enough to remake the world. He was fully convinced of that to the point that he was willing to give his life along with the other apostles. Now, our task is to believe that the message of the Bible has that much power. Now, if, if, I, if you do believe that, then the last thing that the gospel would have you do, the last thing that it means to be entrusted with the gospel if you have recognized that I've been set aside for service. I've been chosen by God to participate in the saving of the world. And then I realize that He has done that to me. He has been gracious to me. And I haven't, been, I haven't done anything to, to prompt Him to be gracious to me. When you have gotten to that place, there's only one place to go from there. And that is to rethink your approach to life. And that new approach is given to us in verse 17. There's a new way to understand how we live the rest of our days. And we call it praise. Now what is praise? Praise is love to God expressed in service to others. That's what praise is. Pr 
when gr the grace of God hits you the way it should, you are now motivated to love God, and that love expresses itself in service to others. That's what praise is. At least that's what I'm calling praise based off verse 17. All right? Verse 17. It doesn't get any better than this. To the king of the ages, to the king of Paul's age, to the king of the early church, to the king of the age of the dark ages, to the king of the age of the middle ages, to the king of the ages of the renaissance, to the king of the ages of the reformation, and so on and so forth, all the way to our age, who is incorruptible. He is not like us. He does not decay. He does not get tired. He does not get weak. Yes, he's invisible. But John says the invisible God has been made visible in Christ Jesus. To the one and only God be honor and glory to the end of every age, so may it be. Amen. All right? That is the new outlook of the Christian. Now, if you adopt that as your way of life, if you, if you say, my new way of seeing life is love up to God expressed in service out to others, that's going to change your life. But if we all do it, it's going to change the church. And if we all do it for a while and direct it outward, it's going to change the city. And you see how that's going to go? City, county, state, region, country, world. Now, let me illustrate, and then I'm going to finish. What I mean by this way of seeing your life as a way of praise and love and service. I think it was last year's missions conference that uh, we, a few of us went to lunch at Bruce and Ida Dunbar's and um, Tom Edwards from the Hope Health Center was there and we were having lunch and I happened to be sitting next to Tom and Tom um, um, has a ministry in Fairfield with a medical clinic and, and that's a very hard job because he's a doctor without all the benefits and compensations that a doctor gets. Um, and he sat down next to me, and he, Tom was a missionary for 14 years in the Ivory Coast. And he said he, he got, really, it wasn't till his work in Fairfield where he realized what I'm saying to you now. He said, I, reali he, he said, I realized the way to get through another day. You know, when there's so much work, so little reward, the way to get through it is to realize that when I wake up and I go to the health clinic, Everything I do for the next eight hours is a love offering to God. I don't do it because I love these people that much. I don't love these people that much. I do love God that much because He's been, He's worthy of that kind of devotion. So it's praise going up and service going out. It's love going up, service going out. And He said, that's kept me going day after day after day after day. All right, so it's love going up vertically, service going out horizontally, and that's the kind of outlook that will change you. That's the kind of outlook that will change us. That's the kind of outlook that will change the world. Now, until that catches fire, we're just going to keep drifting further away and become more and more irrelevant. All right? So, friends, to embrace the gospel is to embrace the power of salvation for us and for the world. And so that means we've got to realize that we've been appointed to the Lord's service. We've tasted saving grace. And there's therefore a new way to live, which is praise to the only God, be honor and glory. And that looks like love and service. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I think about something that Richard said this morning about how much is the Word of God actually changing the way we live? I mean, are we the same people this year that we were last year? Father, I pray that we are not. And I pray that we would hear words like these as they really are, as words of God that can change our life and that can change our world, but we've got to put our faith in them and we've got to get up from the sanctuary and go do them. 
And so, Father, would you help me and would you help us to practice what we've heard preached. Help me to do it, help us to do it, and help us make praise our new way of life. Through Christ we ask it. Amen.